Okay, we're ready to begin. I'd like to reconvene to open session. Uh, this is beginning the open session for the Board of Trustees Healdsburg Unified School District Board Meeting, February 20th, 2019. I have some closed close session business to report out on the uh, public employee appointment. It was motioned by Trustee Romo Flores and seconded by Trustee Del Rey and carried unanimously by roll call vote to appoint Sue Simon as Healdsburg Elementary School interim principal. And I'd just like to, point, like to point out that Ms. Simon is here in the audience today. Welcome. And um, we're thrilled to have her. She comes with us, she comes to us with 12 years experience as a primary principal at Yalupa School, the K3 school in Bennett Valley. So she is seasoned administrator and has jumped in as of yesterday into the job. So we're happy to have her. Thank yes, you, Sue. Absolutely welcome. Thank you all. Thank you. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda this evening? We do not. Okay. I would just like to take a second to welcome everybody to our board meeting. Thank you for partnering with us and um, working with us to make our education system the best we can here in Hillsburg. Um, this is a board meeting in public, not a public board meeting, so we welcome your comments, but please keep in mind that this is our opportunity to, to conduct our business this evening. Um, with that being said, we do welcome you and welcome our audience that's watching, and thank you again for tuning in and being here. Um, if I could ask Donna to lead us in the pledge, please. please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, we are going to start with celebrating our success, and I'd like to welcome up the Healdsburg Junior High AVID program. I threatened him that I was going to do a little dance. I <laughs> love AVID so much, but I'll cut him some slack. <laughs> we want to see the dance. On the logo. Yeah. <laughs> we were having a party in the ladies' room a minute ago. Remember, <laughs> remember we're going to be on TV. This is being filmed. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to introduce uh, Ms. Lillian Fonseca, our eighth grade AVID teacher, uh, although she probably doesn't need any introduction here for this audience. Um, she ha is very, very dedicated to the AVID program. Uh, she brings a lot of uh, heart and passion to um, helping kids, uh, helping students realize their, their dream of uh, attending college. And so we have a little video. Um, I'll let her set it up. And we have some um, of our awesome eighth grade AVID students here with us tonight. Um, I will say that uh, Ms. Bella Barclay, the seventh grade AVID teacher, would have loved to have been here tonight. But she is very, very uh, under the weather and uh, made it through her teaching assignment today, but uh, uh, did need to, uh, need to go home and get herself right. So um, nonetheless, uh, I'll turn it over to Ms. Wonseca. Okay. First, I want to apologize in advance because we tried to do this little video yesterday on very short notice and Bella was not feeling well. So it didn't come out the best that we would have liked it, but it does show some of the beauty of our AVID program. And, and one of the things that we wanted to focus on was our tutorials. We do something called AVID tutorials. Uh, we do those twice a week and it's kind of the heart of our program and what helps our students be so successful uh, once they get through to high school and, and further on. So I'd like to just start the little video and then I'm gonna have my students also share a little with you as well. Divide. No, I think you'd uh, have to subtract the greater yeah. number from the uh, lesser number. That's
is to add the radius to itself to get the Diana. I'm Sophia Paslakwa and this is my first year in AVID. I wanted to be an AVID because I felt like it would give me a better opportunity to go to college and have a better education because I'd get to learn where I'm confused on and I'd get to clarify why I was confused. Um, well, originally I was an AVID and like my goal was kind of pretty much the same thing was like trying to get uh, all A's, trying to get good grades so I can get into the college I want to go in. And, uh... and I've been an AVID for two years. And AVID has helped me be more of a leader and a confident person because I'm, I'm very shy and I don't like to open up a lot. So it's helped me uh, have a lot of confidence in myself. My name is Jack Powell. This is my first year in AVID and uh, AVID's been really helpful uh, because in math, I sometimes it's really hard for me to understand something, and with the tutorials, I get to come here and learn about my problems in that subject, and I get to go back in math class and do them on my own. And it's also helped me to get my homework done on time and get it in, which was a bit of a problem for me last year. Hey, I'm Matthew Carbajal, and uh, this is my first year in AVID, and um, being in AVID has really helped me get focused on all my classwork and staying on task while doing it and actually like having more fun with it. It's, ma it's made me realize that doing classwork and schoolwork is actually kind of fun sometimes. <laughs> well, I think AVID is like supposed to help people get into better colleges and that's what I'm trying to do going to college because my mom always wanted me to and I want to make her proud. And I chose AVID because my sister was an AVID and she said she really liked it and it was really fun and it really is and it's a great experience to have. I wanted to be part of AVID because um, I heard that it helps you um, get better grades and like make you more focused. And it also helps you get like, or know what you want to do for like when you go to college. Or um, my name is Carlos Madrigal. I was in AVID for five years. I decided to join AVID simply because I heard it was a good program and I had a free period. and. AVID was on that period, so I was like, okay, I'll join AVID. And it was awesome. I learned a lot from it. Um, definitely prepared me a lot more for college. And I decided to come back because I wanted to go into teaching, and I already had the connection of AVID. I already knew how tutorials worked. And it was just a perfect, uh, like, perfect place for me to come back and help kids who struggle. Okay, I just wanted to point out that Carlos, who just spoke, uh, was in our AVID program for all those five years, and now he's in now in college, and he comes and tutors on our tutorials himself and another uh, former AVID student, Carlos. They both come in and tutor twice a week in both the seventh grade and the eighth grade AVID class. I also, as you may have noticed, have Pat Sabo. She comes in. The kids are blessed to have her and she really helps them in acquiring that math knowledge. Um, and Mr. Bloomer, he couldn't stay away. <laughs> he, he also comes in and he has a dedicated follower, following of science, students interested in science that meet with him every Tuesday and Thursday. And he told me he sees some budding scientists in that group and they just have all happen to be female, which I think is really cool. So it, it's just, and I just want to say once again that I noticed when I go to the first gen uh, potlucks, the majority of students in that program are AVID students. AVID produces quality, quality students, kids who want to make a future happen for themselves. And they're not going to just sit around and let somebody else do it for them. They're going to work it. And, and that's one of the things that I love about AVID it's my passion. It's one of the favorite parts of my day. Um, I'll miss it when I retire because, and I won't come back to tutor. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Right. I'm not that dedicated. No. <laughs> so anyways, um, I wanted to point out, we're not just all about tutorials. 
We also do major projects. And one of the projects that I'm particularly fond of, and if you've talked to any former AVID students, you would know, um, is a time capsule. Now, this particular set of time capsules, these students are graduating this year. Hmm. Graduation morning, at breakfast, I will be in the cafeteria with their time capsules, and they will run to find me giddy with excitement to open them up and see what treasures they put there when they were in eighth grade. And they write letters to themselves. They write uh, about their teen worries. They write about their hopes and aspirations. They write about their greatest fears. Um, they write letters to one another in, anonymously, so they don't know who has written them a letter that's in there. They put in little tokens of things that will remind them of who they were when they were in eighth grade. And it's beautiful to watch them open them because a lot of them shed tears because they said, oh, we said we would be best friends forever. And look at us, we still are. And then there's also the heartbreak of the time capsules that don't get opened because those kids didn't make it. So it's bittersweet, but mostly it's just very positive. So we do a lot of projects. We go to uh, a university. We go to Sonoma State one year, and then the next year we take them to like Dominican College. Uh, we want to expose them to that world. And we also do a, an AVID family night where the 7th and 8th grade AVID students invite their families, everybody, and everybody brings food. And we all sit together and share a meal and talk and enjoy each other. And it's very well attended. And I'd love to have some of you come when we have our next one. And I also want to invite you, I'd love for you to come on Tuesdays or Thursdays to watch our tutorial process. It's a beautiful thing to see students so focused on getting through difficult um, academic subjects that really might challenge them, but they're ready to attack it through the tutorial process. My fabulous AVID students come up. Do you have any questions for my wonderful AVID students? I'll let them introduce themselves. Lily? Yeah. What what time is the tutorial? Oh, uh, period. I have period. seventh period. <laughs> Just kidding. See, I told you I need to retire. Okay, <laughs> seventh period, and I believe Bella's is first period. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So seventh period and first period, <laughs> and really, it's a beautiful thing. I invite people to come in all the time. Okay, my daughter. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm Matthew Carbohal. I'm in eighth grade. I've been in Miss uh, Fonseca's AVID class for only one year. Um, and this um, class has really made me want to do better in all aspects of my academic life, as well as extracurriculars, um, and has made me want to do what I'm supposed to do, whether it's sports, whether it's activities in class, homework, it has helped me a lot to not procrastinate and to, um, and to just really aim to succeed. Thank you. Hi, my name is Karina Carrillo. I'm in eighth grade. Um, I'm in Miss Fonseca's AVID class. And I joined AVID because I heard a lot of great things about it. And now that I'm in AVID, it has really helped me a lot, like with all my schoolwork. And not only do I think it's AVID that has helped me, but Ms. Fonseca has been a really big part of that. Like, she's a really big influence in my life and really motivates me to do my best in all my classes and try my best in all my work. And not only does she only motivate her AVID classes, but all her classes that she has. And I think that she's so passionate for what she does and so dedicated, and that just really means a lot to me. Mm. Really? Mm. <laughs> Good, e good evening, evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mireya Saldana. I'm in eighth grade, and this is my second year attending AVID. Ms. Fonseca, as Karina just said, has helped us all. With <laughs> <laughs> has helped us all with all our classwork, our schoolwork, and what we do. Yeah. If it wasn't for Ms. Fonseca, I wouldn't be here right now oh. talking to all of you guys. Of problems because I get really shy, but I've 
Miss Fonseca especially has helped me get out of my comfort zone, made me speak out more, and I've become more confident because of AVID. And AVID also taught me to solve my problems, not just to hope that they could magically um, yeah. go away. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Lily, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Lily. And the students, you did a great job. Thank yeah. you for sharing that with us. Very well done. We're very proud of you. All right, moving on. Uh, may I have, may I please have an approval to, I mean, a motion to approve the consent agenda? One second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the uh, consent agenda has been approved. I'd like to thank. <laughs> There's lots of generous donations on the on yeah, the we were gonna, consent um, agenda. Yeah, we were going to we were going to put up something? a slide to to just recognize that and hopefully the um Yeah, absolutely. That shows I was going to read now. it all off. Yeah. Oh good, because I want the folks that are tuning in to see all of this. So, thank you very much for our community is so incredibly generous and a lot of scholarships coming in for the seniors that are going to be graduating. So, thank you very much to those families um, who donate. Absolutely. Thank you for putting that up, Steve. That's great. All right, let's see. Sorry, I lost my place. Two, and public then goes comments. three. Yeah. All right, do we have any public comments? Did you say public comments? Non-agenda items? No. Anything? Okay. okay. All right, thank you. Moving on. Uh, we are on agenda item 11.1, .1, student learning, Hildeberg High School WASC accreditation. So Principal Halliday, that's good news for us. Very good news. And before I talk about WASC, I want to... Um, Recognize AVID. Today I met with the heads of department and the counselors at the high school to talk about our scholarship recipients and from top to bottom our students in all different categories who are eligible for scholarships and our most honored recognition um, continue to be AVID students. And I just want to say publicly that it starts in seventh grade and it really culminates in their senior year in high school so they do a great job. It's nice to see them here tonight. Great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, I sent you a lot of information just recently, mm -hmm. a rather large uh, board packet item. Um, we have a rather large WASC report, but we have a very successful WASC report. We just received our accreditation news a few weeks ago. Um, it was a long time coming. It was two years in the making and a long six months or three and a half months waiting for the results, but we received an accreditation, a six-year accreditation with a one-day midterm review which if they were giving out prizes, this would be the top prize that the accreditation <laughs> committee gives us. Um, so great work by everybody involved. Um, I want to recognize in particular um, Ben Gunter once again, who is our primary writer and compiler of information for the report with support from Linus and uh, Linus Lancaster and Brian Davis who aided him um, with this and the entire high school staff. Everybody had a, a part of this. And as you saw with the documents, it was very, um, very thorough. And it was pleasing to see the work that was done and our recognition for that. Um, and I want to focus on one point before I go to any detail is that what they're really looking for when they come and visit and they read our report is that what we identified in the prior report had been addressed. Right? Mm. What are your critical areas of need? And then they're really f looking for what you what you had done as a high school between the last visits in those critical areas. And so compliments to everybody who came before us and spoke at this podium about the process six years before because they laid a good plan for us to follow. And the faculty was very consistent in their follow through and had a, quite frankly, a laser-like focus. And one of the reasons we got the good report was not simply because we did a good report and we were very thorough and there was a lot of data and a lot of charts to go through. It's because we identified what we needed to work on and we put a plan in place to work on those and we saw improvement in all those critical areas. Okay. The strengths, mission statement, it's really about a process. It's about involving, oh, they identify the strengths and then they talk about our areas of critical need. Uh, they identified just a few areas of broad strengths, our mission statement and school-wide outcomes. Um, it's really about the process that we went through, that we talked to all of our stakeholders, that we really received a lot of information before we went forward and changed our mi mission statement and our student learner outcomes. 
um, including talking to our students about about these and making sure that they were in place with what we were actually doing. Um, Aaron's not here tonight, but the second idea is about professional de development. I'd like to thank Aaron for being incredibly supportive to our faculty for all sorts of opportunities for pre professional development on all sorts of, of disciplines and fronts. Um, the visiting team commented about how um, current a lot of the training was and the expertise that our teachers had and how much that our teachers would demonstrate a willingness to be lifelong learners through our professional development opportunities. Um, number three, about collaboration in school and community. That's really about the connection that we make with our community. It's a small town. It's a small school. It came through in the, port in the report very much that a lot of our action plan items and a lot of our strategies were in conjunction with and coordination with our school community, our greater school community. And the last one about school leadership plans in her disciplinary lessons, um, that's really about teacher leadership, not school leadership, because we um, are proud of our creativity and the flexibility that our teachers demonstrate and how they design their lessons and they design their interdisciplinary or cross-curricular planning. Right? Um, our, our teachers are not um, just in their classroom teaching their own discipline. There's a lot of collaborative activity going on on campus. Uh, in particular, we see that between some of the more core academic disciplines in our CTE classrooms. Okay. All right. Areas of strength continue to be um, that our students have a lot of opportunity. There was more opportunity at Healdsburg High School for 534 kids than you often see at a school of 1,500 students, the number of course offerings and the different pathways to success, as I like to call them, that students have. Um, be that A through G eligibility in our AP course selection or through CTE or a combination of both. Our students have a lot of opportunity. Um, assessments through the school year. We are part of our action plan or area of critical needs is going to be about benchmarking and assessment, but we do have a pretty well, um, well established assessment model through the school that is tied to Common Core standards and it's tied to the state standards internally generated but connected to external measures. Um, number seven is just about, by and large, we're a very welcoming, friendly, respectful, and trusted place. And um, it feels very professional when people come on campus and the teachers feel well respected. I believe the students feel well respected. And I also have to say, as I take one of my many tours around the campus, um, there's a lot to be proud of and what you can share with, with, uh, with visitors. Um, and number eight is just really about quality instruction. So working, working with kids, teaching, reteaching, using different strategies to allow for continued academic progress for all students. School-wide bench, this is about data. The, f the first area of critical need is we, we need to continue to crunch data, as we did when we brought forward our math strategies when Todd and Jamie came and spoke two months ago. Um, we need to do that in all departments. We really need to look at both our external data and our inter benchmarking data and help it inform our instruction, not just tell us about how students are doing. You know, what, what did we do well to achieve these benchmark and assessment results? And what, um, what, do we, what areas do we need to improve? Um, we currently have multiple times a year benchmarks in math, as you know, in Integrated Math 1 and Integrated Math 2. We will in increase that next year in Integrated Math 3. We also have four writing benchmarks in English in all grade levels. Um, established right now, we'll continue that. And in the year to come, what we'll be working on is with our science department and social science departments to also do benchmarking in, in those subject areas. Um, the critical piece of number two is this phrase, that all students can achieve irrespective of their incoming status. Means regardless of how a student comes to us highly prepared, in the mid-band, or struggling, we have, to, we have to create structures to ensure that they can be successful at our high school. And there's a variety of ways that we can do that, and there's a variety of areas of focus that we need to, to look upon, and primarily in mathematics at this time. Um, LCAP expectations and standardized assessments, we need to look at our English and math assessments, our SBAC assessments, PSATs, 
AP and SAT results and just really continue to look at our progress because as much as um, sometimes we wiggle under the system of standardized assessments and tests, that is the system we're in right now. And if we want our students to increase our number of students that are successful at the university level or eligible to be at a successful at the university level, they need to do well on these type of standardized assessments. Um, we have a well-resourced counseling department. We have uh, very thorough guidance and, uh, and support for students, but we do believe that there are some areas that could be addressed as far as uh, immediate service to, to students to ensure, for example, that all, more students are A through G eligible, that all, student, all students are very clear on what their four-year academic plan is as they're an incoming ninth grade student, that we can increase the number of yearly meetings with students and families, and that uh, we do, I think, have really done a good job this last year or so of parent outreach and community outreach about what's, what services are offered through our counseling department, and we just all just need to continue to look at those levels of communication. And then, as with the entire district, we're really looking at our mathematics and English language arts achievement standards and designing plans for those. So that's two pages of bullet points for a 340-page report. <laughs> but when you say alignment of lesson plans, what is that about consistency or what? What is that? And the number two in the critical areas here, alignment of lesson plans for students. Effective lesson plans are aligned with the needs that are present within your classroom. And you have to be able to differentiate your instruction, your lesson plan gotcha. to okay. meet the needs of all the different you. students. You can't have a cookie cutter and come in and expect all students to access that information and that problem solving. Yeah. Well, I just on page 111 in my path. I'm not sure. Oh, it's page 22 and that you gave to us was the number of of. Um, Latino and Hispanic students who are taking AP exams mm -hmm. and. I just wanted to say that um, seven or eight years ago, and I can't remember when the IDT for um, English language development instruction was taking place, one of the messages that um, as the trustee on that IDT that I was conveying was that we wanted to change the demographic makeup in our AP classes, which at that point looked pretty white. And um, I just wanted to compliment you and the staff on the increases, those are substantial numbers of students now in the classes and taking the AP exams. And I, I also wanted to say that um, it's not, it's in addition to the incredible work that your staff has done. Um, and I can't remember the term that you use now that you can self-select into those AP classes, you don't. It's open enrollment. They're open enrollment. That was, that was it. Um, but but seven or eight years ago, we had students who were really stuck mm -hmm. academically, and um, I know that we did a tremendous amount of work unsticking our English learners, and um, I just wanted to point that out that we made a good decision to unstick those kids and give them the academic skills that they needed so that we can have those kinds of increases in those AP classes. So you know, we are proud of those results. We are proud of that switch. But I, I do need to say that that's, a, that's an entire village. Right? That's, I know. Been a, that's been a K-12 program. I know. And that's about really excellent work happening at the elementary and the middle school level. So more students are coming to us ready to take college preparatory classes. Yes. This has yes. to do with our avid teachers. It's the whole oh, it's oh. the whole package. It yeah. Obviously, yeah. just watching but, what mm -hmm. Lily was presenting with. Mm -hmm. yeah. But so unless I'm mistaken, that's also an area for follow-up because we need to improve that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's not representative yet, but it's a you lot know, closer but than it's it was. A, yeah. It's a lot we, better than right. when I used to tour those AP classes. Yeah, we like the, we like the increase, but there's there's areas that we'd like to um, see improvement. You know, for example, this year we have you know we also have a gen we also look at the gender, and traditionally, like in AP statistics class, or excuse me, AP calculus, you're going to see more young men than you're going to see young women. This year, it's just the opposite of that. That's a trend we need to follow because we want to encourage as many young women to go into STEM studies as possible. 
So I, I don't see, and maybe, I don't know if it's going to be on another slide, is there any actions in terms of um, the critical area number five and uh, finding ways to engage the Latino community in the life of the high school culture? There's that recommendation in the WASC. It says, it says, continue to find ways to engage the Latino community in the life of the high school and provide opportunities for Latino families to access school personnel and expanded parent education programs. Yeah. Does that fall on one of these or is that just separate? The, I'm sorry, I forgot to turn my phone off. Sorry about that. Um, I'm presenting the five critical areas that were identified by the visiting committee. One of the areas that was also discussed quite consistently throughout the reporting process was our outreach to our Latino community. And so it is, it continues to be a huge focus of what we're doing. And again, part of um, what we're talking about with responsive counseling services and part of what we're talking about improved academic scores and access for all students relates to what you're, you're bringing up. So it's built into this. It's built into it, yeah, very Thank much you. so. Okay, any other questions for Principal Holiday? No, congratulations. No. Right. Thank you. Yes, and congratulations. congratulations. Good work, thank you. Absolutely. Okay, uh, student learning continued 11.1b. Uh, I know that Aaron's not here this evening, so Superintendent Vanden Heuvel will be presenting on considering the approving of the low, excuse me, the approval of low performing student block grants. Yeah, so Aaron Fender is at the CISC conference, which is the big curriculum and instruction conference in the state um, that happens every year in February. Um, so she's at her first day today. So I told her I could pick this up. Um, so the state this year uh, came out with new one-time funding uh, for low-performing students block grant. So uh, LPSBG, just because we need another acronym. <laughs> Um, and it, as part of this, what this is, is uh, it is funding specifically targeting students who scored a one or two um, on the CASP in the math or English language arts sections, and they are not designated English learners, special ed, low socioeconomic status, foster or homeless youth. So they don't have a, a demographic tag per se, but they're still underperforming. Um, that said, it's targeting them, but we can use it on school-wide activities. Because when we look at it as a district, there's only 36 students that qualified under this um, specific program. So we were given around $1,900 per student. You had to apply. Not all districts f uh, filled an application out. We did, and we got $71,000 as a result. Um, the majority of the students that are identified showed that they needed support primarily in mathematics. Uh, and so we are going to use most of the money to target mathematics specifically. Um, so we are starting with after-school math labs at sites. Um, Erica got one started already with 22 kids in it. Um, and it's not just homework help. They really are taking on more of a growth mindset, looking at math uh, in a different way so that it's more engaging, it's more creative, um, challenges them to to solve complex real world problems and to endure sort of the pitfalls of maybe failing at solving them and to persevere until they can come out of the pit of despair sometimes when you can't solve that problem, which we all do, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so having that growth mindset and to, to persevere and not get stuck, which a lot happens with a lot of students in traditional math instruction, that is all things that we've been um, working on with Dr. Joe Bowler from Stanford. And so we're really excited to continue to engage in that and just think about math differently, differently in a more creative way. We also have earmarked some funds for some staff development and planning in the next two summers. And so you see $27,000 earmarked for that. We are hopeful to have a, um, a long-term relationship with Stanford and Dr. Bowler and, and trust that some of that work will be around her work specifically and we'll have some very specific outcomes we're looking for as a result. Um, with the staff. And then finally, we have a math coach that we're, we're working with um, to focus primarily on engagement, inquiry, and a growth mindset at the junior high. So that's to the tune of $13,000. So the, if this is going to benefit every student in Hillsburg Unified, but um, what we did is we took um, the students that were identified for the funding, looked at where their struggles were and where we could really hone in on to hopefully... Um, elicit some improvement in their outcomes, and, and this is what we came up with. Any questions about the program, about the funding, or what we have in mind? I have a couple questions. Um, I'll, the 36 students that were identified, 
uh, how are we able to encourage them to participate in this? Is it just encouraged? Is it, I mean, I know you probably can't require, how, how's, what is that going to look like? We can come there? really close to requiring. Okay. Um, so I know Erica, for instance, made personal phone calls to students and families and basically said, you need to come to this. And she got every student she called to come. Right. Um, and so we are able to really target uh, specific students by this. And and because it's going to touch so many different programs at all the different sites, it's going to affect more than just those 36, which is really good. Right. And that's yeah. a great bonus. I just want to make yeah. sure that the 36 that particularly right. fall into that very specific uh, definition, we're really reaching out to them. And, mm -hmm. and if others want to come along, that's terrific. Exactly. Um, that's my first question. I'll let yeah. someone else ask. I, I'll come back. I agree. I was going to ask something similar, like, how, how yeah. are those 36 doing? Are we tracking them? You know, like, mm -hmm. how do we... That's part of this success? is we track their their success. Yeah. Good. And I think a follow-up on tracking is to report back uh, to us, to the Absolutely. community. Yeah. The positive results. I'm sure there will be. Go ahead. So the, the number six, the math coach for grades six to eight, are we talking coach for those teachers, the math teachers? Are we talking about coach for the... Students, what does that no, look like? No, for the teachers. And so she's working on instructional strategy with teachers. Uh, Joan Easterday is her name, and she's engaged in the lesson study with the, with the staff. Yeah. The program and that's that been going on. In. Yeah. So this will so continue this will, with exactly, some of this money. Right. Yeah. And will we continue to get this money year after year? Or is no, the goal this to is not a one get time. Because this is a one time, and we have a new, you know. There's a new governor, new budget, things are going to change. <laughs> so this this is not something we should count on in the future. When it sounds like yeah. something we should aim to not get. Like, yeah, we, we don't want kids getting true. ones and twos. We Obviously. want them above yeah. that, and Good we point. don't want this money. Right, right. exactly. Okay. And I, this is the first time, honestly, I've been in education a long time. I've never seen something so narrowly focused. Um, and I, I don't think it will be back, to be honest. Priorities are going to change in the state. So, well, I think it comes at a good time for us, especially as we're reaching out and trying to improve some of that math instruction Absolutely. as well. All right. Yeah, um, I just want to other... commend you guys for applying for it because yes. I know a lot of districts did not. So. Yeah, and it's significant dollars. It's going to Absolutely. benefit our students. Great. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Thank you to Aaron and whoever. It's an action. Yep. It is. We need we your need approval. Yep. May I? Any other questions for? Yes. Okay. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the low performing student block grant spending plan? So moved. And a second, please. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the most motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Vanden Heuvel. All right, uh, moving on to 11 1 C, um, BPE, and then a number high school graduation requirements. So. What do you have for us here? Yeah, so this is back to you on action. Um, uh, so we're looking for approval of uh, increasing the graduation requirements for the high school and changing them for Marcy Becerra. So as you recall, we did not have differentiated requirements for Marcy. Um, it's a it's a need. And, and so we have here a different uh, mode or different path to graduation for our continuation high school students. And then we've brought forward the idea of having two years of foreign language or a language other than English as a graduation requirement to more closely align with the A to G standards um, for UC entrance, CSU entrance, um, with the hope that more kids will become eligible to make those college applications. Um, there are some other smaller changes. Um, we have a service learning requirement and there's a volunteer requirement um, that would be phased in over time. And we also have policy language around every student being scheduled in an A to G course of study, which is going to be hard not to be, really, honestly. Um, but there's a process delineated in the policy for that to make sure that it happens in ninth and 10th grade. So um, we've talked about this three or four times. Um, I've met with the staff. Bill's talked with his staff on numerous occasions. He has convened his leadership team to talk about potential strategies to make sure students are successful reaching these higher requirements, and they'll continue to work on that as the requirements are phased in over time. Um, but I do think we're primed and ready to do this, and I'm excited for the change. What is the feedback from the staff? Uh, questions about how we're going to make sure everybody can can reach this high bar. I right. think that's that's been the biggest concern. Um, some questions about how many requirements are we going to put in. We did a seven-period day six or seven years ago, and then we added requirements as a result. So there's a there's a... 
there's a view that we've taken away a bit of flexibility on the part, you know, from the student point of view and maybe the staff point of view, which, you know, I can't argue with entirely. Um, but the college system is what it is and we want as many kids as possible to have that opportunity. And so, um, this is our response to that. So, um, mostly just wanting to make sure we're working together to make sure kids can be successful. So, so when are you going to let us know how this is going? Well, you get report back every year in LCAP on graduation rates and on the A to G completion rate. Um, so we have a constant metric to see how okay. this is going. Yeah. So maybe we should add a metric that's looking at how many kids are opting out and kind of trying to get an understanding of why. And Well, we, we, we will see it. I mean, I guess you could see that before you see the A to G rate, but um, as the A to G, my, my belief is our A to G rate will climb as a result. Yes. Right. And so... If it doesn't, it's because kids are opting out, and then we can take a look. But it, yeah. it might just be something not to wait until they graduate. Yeah, and but as we do this. And did they right. not? But yeah, I would. It would be an interesting. It would be thing. interesting to like. Uh, right. You know how many people are consciously choosing to opt out, and and why, and why. And there will only be to be totally transparent. There's going to be there's three ways you could opt out essentially. One is you don't pass your class with a C or higher, right? So that doesn't require a form or parent permission. Um, no. But if you get a D, <laughs> no, you're not you A to G approved. It, uh, yeah. The second is um, you choose to not take IM3, right? So we do have a three-year math requirement, but we don't require IM3. That is just short of A to G requirements. We do have uh, other math classes they can take. Um, there, there will be some kids as juniors and seniors who opt there. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third is to go to Marcy. Otherwise, because of our graduation requirements, you'll complete all the other A to G requirements. So there's really not a lot of wiggle room to opt out. But right? even if you don't get a, oh, I see. You're saying if you get a the infamous D. Yeah, that's not a counselor transaction with a parent, right? No, that's, no, no. I yeah. know, but I mean, if you if you fail a class, you have to take it again to graduate, right? Correct. So but if you pass with a D, well, you could pass with a D. You could so pass. You could graduate, but you could not fulfill A to G. Yes. So that's a college right. uh, discussion. The D. That's a whole separate discussion. Yes, um, it, is. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, we were aware. And it would be a very I mean, long. Just, separate I mean, discussion. especially yeah. since this is something now we're we're having the student and the family choose consciously. Right. Uh, it would be interesting to just even for the first couple of years to. Yeah, and we want to scaffold this and, and get as many students to be successful as possible. So, yeah. Well, I just want to commend you for doing bringing this forward because um, I think it's critical that we have that high bar, that high expectation for all students. And as you know, AB 2735 just passed where they're saying all English learners must be placed in these classes and given this opportunity and the fact that um, it's already been happening here and we're making sure that it's happening. I just want to commend yeah, all of you for you. this important work. Any other questions or discussion? Yeah, no, I, th I agree with Araceli. I think it's great that we are putting these systems in place mm -hmm. to make sure that the students are ready, whether uh, their families are informed on what ready looks like. I think it's great that we're setting them up and putting them on that path Absolutely. of readiness so they don't get to the end and someone right. didn't know oops. or understand. Or Yeah, so I think no oops. I mean, that's a lot of work on the board before I even got here. So I, I really appreciate yeah. that. And I think we recognize yeah. the value for all of our students that we just put those plans in place. So I appreciate that. All right, this is um, another action item. May I have a motion to approve the high school graduation requirements? So moved. And a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 I think that was unanimous. Uh, that motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Vanden Heuvel. Thank you. Don't go far, I think you're next. <laughs> My next still. <laughs> All right, uh, then we have, um, 11-1-D, the HUSD Equity Task Force uh, yeah. report. So not uh, a ton to report here. Um, we did have our first task force meeting. We have the slide coming up, Steve. Thank you. Uh, we had our first um, town hall meeting, not task force meeting, on February 5th. We had over 120 people in the audience, which was great to see. Um, and it was very representative, demographically speaking, um, of our stakeholders. And a lot of good conversation and engagement and note taking and um, storytelling happened. Um, and, and these town hall meetings really are about continuing with the listening campaign that we engaged in with the National Equity Project and getting more input and hearing more stories and hearing more experiences so that after this next one next week on Monday, 
we will be able as a task force to sit down and really identify critical areas of need. You know, when we started this whole process, I said to you this, I had a plan and it was based on what I was hearing and my agenda, right? And we have folks in the community who might have a different agenda. And we didn't want it to be about any one person or group's agenda. We wanted it to be about our community's agenda. And so this is an extension of the listening campaign so that we can really be collectively creating an agenda together and taking on um, changes that need to be made as a result of that and reflecting that. So we have future task force, me task force meetings that will be convened in March and April. And then I do anticipate in April coming to you and saying, here are some things that we've identified as critical areas of need. We're going to open this up to broader stakeholder engagement and um, and begin tackling them. You know, I said at the town hall meeting, I don't anticipate major, major structural change or systemic change happening for next school year. There are things we've already worked on. We are translating differently. We've actually sent our in-house translators or in-district translators to trainings. Um, We've tweaked a little class, a little bit of class makeup and things like that. Um, but the big systemic things, kind of the elephant in the room would be the elementary configuration, is not going to be tackled and finalized until next fall. Um, we'll start working on it, but I don't know that we're going to have uh, um, any changes to propose until then. I want to be mindful and thoughtful and strategic in how we do this. Um, so very pleased with the turnout. Very hopeful that we'll have another turnout um, this coming Monday that is representative. Uh, we did move the second meeting from the 26th to the 25th uh, because of catechism classes at St. John's and, and recognizing that a lot of our Latino stakeholders have children in that and that might preclude them from coming. Uh, so would welcome anybody, you know, obviously all of you and anyone in the audience to be there and participate. And I, you know, my biggest takeaway, honestly, from the town halls is we need to do more of them. Uh, it was a really healthy process and a good way for folks to engage and be able to have their voice heard. So I would I would say that that's definitely one thing that will come in future um, future strategic talks is having more town halls on specific topics and really finding ways to bring our community together and to listen to each other so that we can kind of co-create this vision for our schools um, across the various communities we have within Hillsburg. So mm -hmm. any questions or discussion? I think we have a public comment. We do. Yeah. I, I have a, just a yeah. comment. I'm, I just want to say I was blown away. Um, when I saw, I walked into the room and it was filled. And it was mm -hmm. great to see that many people. Um, I also want to encourage everybody as, as the data comes out, as the comments come out, is to listen and, and to read uh, to, with an open heart. Because there's a lot of things that are being said. It's like it feels like, oh, you're accusing me of something or you're saying I'm not good enough at this. It's not that. It's a perception of where we are, what we have to say in the little sticky notes, and we have to look at those. We have to try to look at the perspective, and again, just look at, let's listen with an open heart and then move forward. And I um, just uh, compliment the Equity Task Force. It's doing, doing a great job. Look forward to more. Thank you. So let's have the public comment. We can talk more. Yeah, absolutely. Ms. Janine Bingham, if you'd like to come on up. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Thank you for taking time to listen to me. Of course. So I got the short end of the stick or all of my committee was sick. So I'm the one that's going to read a letter. So I'm strictly reading. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Healdsburg Equity Initiative. I've been a part of that group since May. And I just want to piggyback on what Chris said. It was just joyous to see so many people in the room when I got there. And I know everybody in our group felt it was just uplifting. We had the opportunity to have our meeting the very next day. And so out of that, we kind of brainstormed some ideas on how to maybe improve February 25th. And so a letter was written on behalf of our group. Um, I'm going to read it. Chris has it. Um, I believe it was sent, and we can send it to all of you, but we just wanted to read it so it's in public. They timed me. It took me two minutes and 50 seconds. Okay. Here we go. Several members of the Equity, Healdsburg Equity Initiative group had the opportunity to attend the first town hall on February 5th. We were happy to see such a large turnout of individuals wanting to share their stories, and we're each glad to participate in the listening and sharing of our own experiences and thoughts. Before the next town hall, we wanted to bring some things to your att attention 
concerns regarding the components of the meeting directly related to language. Specifically, we felt the linear translation back and forth was tiring and extended the length of the presentation. We also wanted to express concern regarding the separation of the small groups by language. When we are struggling already with separation in our district, we see this division by language as a missed opportunity to bring people together to hear each other's stories and perspectives. To this end, we have the following recommendations for you, it was written to Chris, the task force and the NEP to consider. So we want all the stakeholders to consider these. One, do a simultaneous translation for the opening presentation using headsets. This will expedite the beginning of that session and allow for more time for the parent and community interaction and dialogue to, have, to happen. Number two, to perhaps randomize breakout groups that are a mixture of languages. We came up with this idea. This can be facilitated by passing out randomized group numbers when people first enter the room. And then when you break them up, the tables are numbered and people will just go to that table. Three, there would, I think this did happen, but we, you know, piggybacking and wanting to ensure it happens, have the bilingual facilitator, scribe, and timekeeper at each table. These 10 to 15 facilitators should meet in advance of the town hall for perhaps one hour to understand their role in seeking information, sharing time within the different participants, and splitting time between two topics or two questions. Number four, the groups should be smaller so everyone gets a chance to speak. So 10 to 15, so thinking maybe there would be 15 stations. Five, this was key. Do not shift tables of people, but instead just shift the topic at the certain time that everybody would shift topics so that people could stay put. It felt so chaotic kind of in the moving around, and I think we lost some of the good dialogue that might have been happening in the first sit down. Number six, we thought perhaps it would be a good idea to have simpler topics back to one or two, or one topic and one question, and, and just keep it simpler. Um, we hope that you have time to consider implementing some of these solutions. Thank you, the Healdsburg Equity Initiative. Thank you, Janine, that very much it. for your thoughtful comments. Thank so you for representing your group. Yeah, we just thought it was great and we wanted to we'll see you all on February 25th. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So any other questions or discussion on the town halls or the task force itself? I would say those are some uh, things to consider. So yeah, I can, you know, without getting into it, I can yeah. tell you everything that was suggested was something that we've had, you know, we we wrestled with the formatting. Um, sure. Well, it was the first yeah. time. I mean, it was, it was. certainly something. And, and there's part of what we're doing is trying to listen and get as much dialogue as possible. I will say I have a vision for later on doing town halls that might do be more effective in bringing people together from different communities. Um, but we really wanted people to be comfortable sharing um, so that we could get as much possible down as possible. And so that was um, some of the reasoning behind it. And it's something that we talked about as a task force for a long time. Um, and so, but, and you know, there was a number of us who stayed after and talked about, okay, what should we tweak and that kind of thing. So there will be some changes. Um, but some of the things that we did do were, were done intentionally right. um, for a specific outcome. So. Um, but I do appreciate the comments, and, and I think we're all in it for the same reason. So yeah, it's absolutely. really great to see. Yeah, and I just want to appreciate the fact that there was obviously a lot of um, outreach in Spanish because the it was mm -hmm. great to see that there was equal representation from um, bilingual families or Spanish-speaking families and mm -hmm. English-only families. That was really great to see that mm -hmm. participation, yeah. equal participation. The other uh, commendation is just the excellent translation service that was provided that evening. Julie is here, yes. so yeah. It was, She's not translating for well anybody done, tonight, but so, yeah. um, We heard that over yeah. and over yeah, it again. It was very well done, and so I just want to thank you for all of that work. Absolutely. Yeah, she's expert. <laughs> well, will there be similar outreach for Monday's meeting? Are we going to kind of do that all again? or S Similar outreach, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, absolutely. And it was included in the outreach last time also, both dates, right? It wasn't just targeting the one, so, right. Well, yeah. yeah. And I understand Miss Marks did a lot of personal phone calls. Is that right, Mr. Halliday? 
So reaching out to yes, our Latino family. So if you pass on our appreciation to her too. So I know she spent a lot of time just calling families and inviting them to come. So yeah. obviously that made it. Yeah, all, all the sites did. So yeah, yeah yes. absolutely. So. That was the only thing that I knew of. So thank you for those other ones Great. that did too. Thank all right. you. Thank you. Great report. Good, good stuff to follow. All right. Uh, personnel 11.2. We have a resolution. Resolution 1918 Public Agency Retirement Services, a PARS Supplementary Retirement Plan. And Steve. Right. So this is the third time we're offering a retirement incentive through the Public Agency Retirement Services Group, or PARS. Uh, the last one was just two years ago. But we realized that some folks were just weren't quite able to take advantage of it at that time and thought it might make sense looking at the demographics to go back out again. We sit down with the PARS folks, give them all of our employee data, and they kind of go through and see where the logical breaks are and where it might make sense to do an offering. And they agreed that maybe it was okay to go ahead and come back out so quickly. So we offered to employees who were 54 or older with 15 years or more of service at the end of this current school year. Uh, we had 18 eligible certificated staff members and 10 classified members. And so tonight's action is just to say, yes, we authorize you to go ahead and pursue this, sign the contract with PARS, and, uh, and make the offering, which we've already kind of done. <laughs> and then we'll come back to you on March 11th and say, okay, here are the folks that committed to doing this if we go forward. At that point, we get to make a decision if financially it serves the needs of the district or not and make a final decision at that point. So we'll have a full analysis of costs and savings um, depending on who puts in, uh, and then we'll make a recommendation based on that. Perfect. Right. Okay, This any other discussion or questions for Steve? All right, this um, is a roll call vote. Um, I move that we accept oh, resolution. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for moving. I'll second. <laughs> thank you for seconding. And now we have a roll call vote. I wonder Debbie was looking at me like, <laughs> thank you. Aye. 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 All right. So that passes unanimously. I'm moving on to uh, School Business 113A, Healdsburg Unified School District calendar for 1920. All right, so we have um, worked with the association on uh, coming up with a calendar for next year. It's very similar to this year's calendar. Um, I'm already getting emails and even texts from family members wanting to know when the first day of school is so they can make their vacation plans. Um, so the first day of school would be on August 15th. Um, we would have two staff development days. There was some talk about embedding one of those days in the year. Um, we worked with the association on that um, and decided not to do that. So staff development days in August. Um, and then another, actually, the, if you can scroll down, Steve, highlight for teachers, especially in the elementary school, is November 1st would be a staff development day. That is the day after Halloween. Um, so there is, is a genius. sugar crash that happens with students. Uh, and so it's a Friday, it would be yeah. staff development, and the little ones will be home um, or in child care. <laughs> they'll so, so, all be thrilled. Yes. And what that means is for the next three years, we don't have to deal with the, the, the students post-Halloween. So that um, they were very pleased with that. Um, so November 1st would be our, our fall staff development day. And then, of course, we have one on January 6th as well. Uh, we similar to this year's schedule and so graduation steve if you could keep going down uh is june 5th last day of school on the fourth i'm wondering if you've ever considered doing a winter uh spring ski break in february you know we try to align primarily with uh bigger districts in the county because yeah. a lot of our employees have children that are students there or they live in those districts and so there's not a lot that do the full ski week. Um, you see it more in the private school crowd. I just wonder. Yeah. So I, I just hear comments about, gee, it would be really nice if I we know. had that. And and for us, it's really about taking care of our employees and making sure we're not giving them undue child care costs or things like that by having to work on other time, days and things. So um, okay. always open to conversations, and it's, it's always a moving target. But um, really, I mean, to be quite honest, what happens in the county of Santa Rosa City kind of drafts something and says, this is what we're thinking, then we all base all off of all. that. And it's not completely perfect um, <laughs> off of Santa Rosa City, but um, they, they drive the calendar in the county, if we're being honest. So, okay. okay, any other discussion? All right. Thank you, Mr. Vanden Heuvel. Thank you. All right, 11-3B change order for the Healdsburg High School track and field modernization project. Steve. 
right? So as we talked last month or two months ago when we did the change with the uh, notice of completion, excuse me, uh, they finally got the numbers to balance for the change order. Overall, it's a reduction to the final contract price with the contractor of $166,384, which, which is a Very good thing. Very nice. We added a lot of things that we needed and wanted and still saved a little money off the overall contract price. So for the entire project, we had kind of budgeted about $10 million. Uh, mm -hmm. came in at about seven and a half. We don't have all of the invoices yet, but by the time you add in the construction inspector, inspector construction management, a DSA fees, um, testing, soil testing, compaction testing, all sorts of fun things like that, other costs ends up being more than what you see just on this contract for the general contractor. But, uh, but again, happy that it came in less and happy nice. that the overall project came in less than we had anticipated. So. And it's also beautiful. It sure is also is. beautiful and being used, awesome. I think, Quite, quite a lot already, so. Yeah. So on time and 20% under budget. Uh-huh. Yeah. Not too bad. Here, here. Different than other local construction projects. Yep. Yeah. And you need a. Kudos to the construction gang. Yeah, if those are the numbers, it's more like 25%. Nice job. Yeah, exactly. Well, very nice. Wonderful. All right, this is an action item. May I have a motion to approve the change order for the Healdsburg High Track and Field Project? So moved. And a second? All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, it was unanimous. All right, moving on to uh, 113C budget assumptions. Uh, the Board of Trustees will consider approval of the preliminary budget assumptions. Steve? Yeah, this presentation in your packets, but I'll go ahead and walk you through it briefly. And if you have any questions, uh, please jump in. It's pretty early in the budget process, but we try to come to you now and start getting us all thinking about next year, even though it's kind of hard to believe. <laughs> uh, the first thing to really consider is the better we finish 2018-19, the better off we are starting next year, right? If we have more, more money in the bank, better savings account, then uh, things can be a little different next year. Looking at this year, and we'll talk more about this year in a couple minutes at second interim, we're still being very conservative on property taxes. Uh, we're still being extremely conservative on RDA. Um, the fire money still hasn't been acknowledged or, or received, so we'll talk more about that in a minute. And expenses are still conservatively high in the 17, I'm sorry, in the 1819 budget. Mm -hmm. So well, we believe we're going to finish 1819 better, which means we start off 1920 better. Looking at 1920, we're conservatively assuming a 4% increase to secured property taxes. You know, there are several different property tax buckets that come to us. Secured is the bulk of it. And so that's the one that's important that we try to get fairly close to being right. And that's the one that we never get right because the county treasurer can't seem to give us an accurate number. <laughs> um, again, and, and Mike, you may not have heard this before, but SCO, whenever we try to talk to them about our property taxes, they look at us and say, you guys are the toughest district in the county to budget because there's so many different factors that affect Healdsburg that are unique to Healdsburg than the rest of the county. So it's always a little bit of a game. The county always tells us we're, we're too aggressive and we're sitting there thinking that we're being too conservative. So it's a, it's a fine line. We continue to assume that RDA will only be at 75% of 1617 numbers, which is, as you'll see in the next presentation, it's really ludicrously low, but um, it's more than the county wants us to even do. One big hit to the budget is that there will no longer be the one-time uh, discretionary funds coming to the district from the state. That was 270,000 this year. We kind of knew it was the last year of that. It was Jerry Brown's kind of last hurrah to districts to give us a little bit of money without strings attached, and it is not in Governor Newsom's new budget. So that is one hole we do have to backfill. We are kind of assuming it for now, comparable support from HEF as to this current year. And we think that's pretty realistic, maybe even pretty conservative. So. Steve, before you move on, you're saying 4.5%. Sorry, 4.5% in the current, in the t current yes. budget, but you're saying 4% here, or is that right. because it's, it's total so only. far off? Yeah. Because we won't even get our final property tax numbers for 18, 19 until August. I know. And so to get too, to get too aggressive there, we don't have any numbers for this year, let alone next year. It's just gotcha. a little too okay. scary. It's too, too goofy. In terms of the calendar, enrollment, and staffing, we assume that uh, they're still going to have a 188-day calendar, which we just looked at just a minute ago, 181 instructional days and seven non-student days. We're projecting a pretty big drop in enrollment again of almost 5%. For enrollment, again, we just kind of do a straight cohort projection. Okay, if we have 100 second graders, we'll have 100 third graders next year kind of thing. 
We try to factor in for the students coming back from Alexander Valley and Westside at sixth grade and seventh grade, and students coming in from St. John's at ninth grade, take some educated guesses looking at the last few years, and we still end up guessing high, typically, um, because of, the, of people leaving the, leaving the district, unfortunately. We, we're assuming the seven period day continues at the junior high, and Chris, I believe that's not an assumption anymore. No, that's, that's a, no longer an assumption, yeah. Okay. And we believe we'll be able to reduce 1.0 certificated FTE due to the declining enrollment, especially at the secondary level. Uh, so that's kind of back to the PARS agreement again that helps us maybe reduce the position without having to impact anybody who wanted to teach here next year. So. For compensation, we're assuming the 3.5% salary schedule increase because we've already negotiated that. That's already set. Uh, no change to the health and welfare cap at this point in time. Assuming we go forward with the PARS, which we'll know on March 11th, there would be a savings to the district, otherwise we wouldn't be going forward. And one little bit of good news in the governor's new budget proposal is that the salary-driven rates will be the same for next year, except that STRS in particular is dropping from what we had been budgeting. Uh, he's down to, uh, it's only going to increase from 16.28% to 17.1%, just a little big increase, but it's not going up to the 18.1% that we had been using at first interim for uh, next year. I have two questions. Yes. Are, are you finished with that one? Sure. Okay. Um, I don't, what is the uh, health and welfare cap? What is that? It depends on if you get post-employment benefits or not, and it depends on if you're covering a spouse or your family or not. So it, it's a three-tiered, two-tiered I'll talk to you thing. later. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> okay. And then, one of those are, it's not simple. You a cup of coffee right. and sit down. Yeah. And then on the last item, I would caution um, the district in believing that that We'll go forward in the budget only because I think the governor's budget was generous and the LAO came out saying we're not getting the taxes that we thought we were getting and perhaps there's another way to look at that. I assume you know that. but Right, and so we'll get lots of chances to revise this. Uh, mm -hmm. not, again, in June, we'll have new information from school services. We typically stick with school services projections for this kind of stuff just because otherwise, I mean, it's, it's easy to defend and if we're wrong, it's okay, let's adjust. Yeah. Whereas if we go out on our own and say we're just going to be higher or going to be lower, it's a little a little bit more difficult for us to to explain and justify. So, but so you're right; these are that is a budget proposal. There's no guarantee. It's and may happen. revise is when we typically get more information. So yeah. And PERS, I think, is not going to increase quite as much. It's going to be one tenth of a percent less. Woohoo! All right. Well. Oh yeah, we'll take it. But at least they're talking in Sacramento about understanding that this is getting to be a real burden for school districts. That's that's the good news to take from this. Even if the material the savings don't materialize. It's next year, they know districts can't keep supporting these increases year after year. Yeah, and the, and, and the governor's budget and some bills that are supposedly coming out both reflect the need to the, for the state to help shore up retirement costs and the cost of special education. Those are the two big things that all the districts have been screaming in the in the state about. So it's nice to see whether it happens or not. At least we're being listened to. Yeah. Step in the right direction. And thanks for mentioning the special ed piece. We're not assuming any special ed revenue increases at this time because by the time it comes down through the SELPA and then to us, it's hard for us to know exactly what that increase would look like. So until we have something concrete from the SELPA, we're not going to assume anything different than what we've been assuming. On the expense side, we're assuming that our expenses will be pretty comparable to this year, except that um, we do need to invest in technology again. Um, we kind of know that. We kind of knew that coming into this, uh, especially Chromebooks. Uh, they're going to last three or four years, then we have to reinvest. Uh, we've kind of targeted the sixth grade students and ninth grade students as the ones getting new Chromebooks, and they're going to last them for their time at the junior high and their time at the high school. And so it's time to start you know, buying Chromebooks. So you see we're looking at on the student device side, probably we're, we are behind a lot of the devices. Because we haven't had this rolling structure in place, a lot of the devices we have now will not be supported after the end of next year because we've got a big curve to get up over, then we can kind of flat it out some after that. Um, perhaps more importantly in some ways is the staff devices. We have not always been able to keep pace with staff devices. Some of those laptops that are being used in the classrooms are um, well past their end of life, and so we definitely want to get some new technology in the staff's hands. And so that's a big priority for us. We've done quite a bit already this year. That's why we think we can 40,000 next year will get us uh, kind of fill in the rest of that gap. Then we can start doing it on a little more planned basis going forward. So one other nice piece of budget news for us is the E-rate program, which some of you may be familiar with, used to kind of give us a discounted rate on our telecommunication services, which was never a big part of what we do here. But now it's kind of more towards giving us money for technology. 
once every five years, districts can get a pretty big chunk of money to reinvest in their technology. We are eligible for $200,000, which we want to use primarily to upgrade HES's infrastructure. It is not really set up to support all the wireless devices that we're adding there. Um, the caveat with this is that we have to match 20% of it. So for us to get 200,000 from the state for E-rate, we have to spend 40. Seems like a pretty good deal to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we would definitely want to look at doing that. That may not all hit in 2019, 20. It may take a couple years for us to get all the work done, but we kind of need to assume for budget purposes that it would all happen next year. You're estimating that the cost to do those upgrades to HES is going to be 240,000 ish. We got the first couple bids in for, for part of the project was about 140. And so, but then we have some, and we want to do some other stuff too. It's not just HES, but that's the bulk of it. Okay. So it may not be that high when all is said and done, or we may decide that. We can't afford to do some of those things. We'll, we'll kind of look and see. But we've, we've put together our wish list. The vendors come back and say, here's what it'll cost. Then we make some decisions. Other considerations. And this one needs to have an asterisk next to it because nobody can tell us for sure. At some point, we're required to make a contribution to routine restricted maintenance every year. Mm. It used to be 3%. When the budget crisis hit, they relieved us of that burden and made it equal to the 2012-13 amount, I'm sorry, the 14-15 amount of 577000 Well, it goes back up to 3% either next year or the year after. Depends who you ask when it goes back up. But when it does, it's going to go up to about 725000 which is a pretty substantial jump. The nice thing from my perspective is that might allow us to hire somebody else for the maintenance department to kind of keep all of our new stuff looking good and, and, and working well. So I think it's money we can definitely spend well, but it is another burden on the general fund. And then, as you know, there have been a lot of conversations about class size and about instructional aids, especially at the K-2 level. Depending on where those conversations go, that can certainly have a budget impact as well. So, so on the routine restricted maintenance, is that how we pay for our um, soon-to-be new Operations guy, Glenn. Yes. <laughs> the new yes. Glenn. Correct. The new Glenn. <laughs> right. The director of maintenance and operations. Yes. Yes. Comes out of this. Thank fund. you. I right. knew there was a. But time. so it is a contribution from the unrestricted general fund to a restricted program inside the general fund. And that's where that's why it hurts us from a term standpoint of taking away general fund dollars. Okay. Got it. It, it forces us to reinvest in our facilities, which is never a bad thing. No, but it, it is just going up. It's something to no, be aware of. It's not. So any questions, concerns with our assumptions so far? We'll continue to refine these and come back to you as we learn more about the governor's budget and about uh, other things. But uh, maybe we'll even get an answer to this one in the meantime. So, question in terms of, um, I know you, HES needs the infrastructure. But um, so is there, I'm sure there is a plan in terms of, I know that I saw that in the WASP report, that, it, that Hillsburg High School is in need of the infrastructure Revamping that was mm. part of the recommendation for that was the old wash that report, maybe one? that you saw. Yeah, oh. no, the Hillsburg High School infrastructure was updated a couple years ago. Oh, was it? Oh, okay. Yeah, probably oh, the maybe most, I read the last one. Okay. most robust Wi Fi of any okay, high school exactly. in the county, I would imagine. Well, yeah, good. yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, but a lot of our wireless access points at all of the sites now are now five, six years old, so it's time to look at refreshing updates. some of those yeah. and things. So that is part of it as well. And I didn't explain e rate very well, but in case you're not familiar. It doesn't let us go off and buy devices for students or staff. It really is the stuff that's behind the wall mm -hmm. and in the air. It's the infrastructure. It's not, it's not putting something in a student's hands. Right. It's just making what they have work a little better. Mm -hmm. In the air. <laughs> <laughs> yep. In the ether, yeah. All right. Any other questions for Steve? All right. If I may please have um, a motion to approve the preliminary budget assumptions for 2019 and 20. So moved. A second, please. Okay. All in favor, uh, say aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. Uh, all right, Steve, again, the second interim report. Okay, since we haven't talked budget enough yet tonight, we'll talk some more. So, uh, again, second interim, this is a point in time as of about last Tuesday or Wednesday of where things kind of stood with our budget. Uh, this is a requirement that we do this. It's due to the County Office of Education by March 15th. So we're actually a month early with this, which has created some challenges. Uh, because our, our March board meeting is until after the 15th, we had to go and try to get it done now. 
So being a month early, you would think wouldn't have that big of an impact, but it really kind of does. There's so much we still don't know. Um, we know precious little more than we knew at first interim, really. We have gotten no revenue projections from the SELPA yet or expense projections for all the students that we have being served by the SELPA. Those come out at the end of February. I tried to get a sneak peek from, from the SELPA and they, they couldn't do that for us, so that didn't help. We were supposed to have received information from the North County Consortium back in December. Uh, we got it last Wednesday, which was too late for me to include in this interim, so that's a big chunk of our special ed expenses. Looking at it briefly, it looks like it's about what we expected, but it would have been nice to have had some time to really look at the numbers and, and make sure they were right. And, we didn't get that, so. Uh, and again, the fire money we've talked about, there's this $300,000 bag of money that's gonna come back to us. <laughs> We're supposed to get it in late January, early February. Um, <laughs> don't, don't have it yet, so uh, any day now, I even checked about 4.15 this afternoon before I came over here and <laughs> wasn't in our bank account yet, so. But any day now, we'll get that money and we'll know how much it really is and, and we'll have it, so. That will definitely change our outlook a little bit as well. So what has changed since first interim? We've revised property taxes a little bit. We're still being pretty conservative. Overall, they're slightly higher than first interim. If you take away the RDA piece, they're really a little bit lower than first interim, but that's just because of the various in and outs that come with the property taxes. The June RDA distribution is conservatively budgeted at 250,000. Typically at this time of the year, we've, we've budgeted zero, but we know this is not realistic. If you take a look at what the distrib distributions have been for the last several years since the program started, you'll see that we always get something in June. So the budget zero is a little bit disingenuous. Um, yes, we have no idea how much it's gonna be. We, I'll know a little bit more in March, but for right now we have no idea. So you can see the January is the actual amount we received, the 1.889 million. We're conservatively assuming we're gonna get 2.5 million. You can tell me it'd be half a million, you can tell me it'd be a million, and, I, and I'd believe you, but until mm -hmm. we know, we don't know. Again, SCO is still telling us we should be budgeting a million dollars for this. Total, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, at the initial budget, we budgeted 1.5 million, which was that two thirds of the 16, 17 amount, which again, they still say is being too aggressive. So at first interim, we're budgeting everything we got in January plus the 250. What we got in January was 80% of what we received last year. So again, we think this is still conservative, but more realistic. And the county's still gonna write us up in the letter that we all get and saying that we're being too aggressive in our projections. Okay. Expenses are up slightly um, on the unrestricted side. As we know more about how we're spending money, we've gotten some local grants in and things like that that allow us to spend a little more this year on some things. You know, the CTE Commission, the CTE Committee of Sonoma County yeah. has given us sixty, seventy thousand dollars this year that comes into the unrestricted side of the general fund. As we get one of those checks, we bump up our expenses accordingly. The restricted side of the general fund has changed almost not at all. Again, the biggest chunk of that is special ed, and as I've already explained, we don't, don't know any different than we knew a couple months ago. You'll see that transfers in and transfers out are lower than they were at first interim. That really reflects the amount of money we can take from the charter school fund at the end of the year. Whatever there's money is left in the charter school fund comes back to the district, and this we think there'll be less there now. Uh, there is no change to the encroachments for maintenance or for special ed at this time, and overall the ending balance is about the same as it was the first interim. Looking at the multi-year, everything we just talked about a few minutes ago isn't included in, second, in, in the multi-year projections because you hadn't approved those assumptions yet. But based on the current assumptions, we are deficit spending in all three years. It's not a lot, but, and it's by design, but that still makes the county send us another nasty letter. Uh, we're projecting reserves of almost 12% at the end of 1920, which is down about a percent from where we thought we'd be at first interim. Right. And reserves of almost 10% at the end of 2021, which is down a couple percent. But again, that's a point in time. And we know so many things are gonna impact this year's budget that, that two years out is really almost comical to try to really nail down. All the other funds are solvent. Um, the one caveat there is that Fund 13, the Child Nutrition Fund, we already have a contribution budgeted to that. It may be a little more when all is said and done. Food costs have gone up some. Staffing costs have been about the same. We haven't been able to reduce any staffing really because we're still serving it. The meal count is about the same as last year even though we have less kids. Mm -hmm. But so our food costs are up and our staffing costs are the same. So there may be a little bit more of a kick in from us. 
our next steps, continue to spend smartly. As Chris and I like to say, if, if it's the right thing to do for the district, we're gonna do it. If it fits in the budget, if it's something we can live without, we're gonna really question it and push back on it. We're gonna keep trying to get information on revenues, keep looking at expense budgets, start working on the LCAP and budget for 1920, and then come back to you in May with third interim. Okay. And that's it. All right, any questions for Steve? All right, if I could please have a motion to approve this uh, second interim report. So moved. Second. second. Thank you. All in favor, aye. 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 The motion passes. All right, um, 11-3C. We have the 2019 California School Board Association CSBA Delegate Assembly Elections. So we have a really tough decision. There's one vacancy and one candidate. Um, for our CSBA delegate, uh, and so our opportunity to elect this person, or I guess we, we could choose not to, right? That's, <laughs> we could not vote for them or to vote. So it's Jenny Close, who's from Santa Rosa City Schools, would be our representative. Oh. Oh. So is the action then to vote for Jenny? You would need Jenna. a motion and a discussion, and then the board collectively votes. Mm -hmm. Do we know Jenny? Anybody know oh, Jenny? I'll, I'll put the motion so we have a okay. motion. Like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll move that we uh, move forward with this. Yeah, I think she's great. We need to have a motion. Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll second it. Okay. And then, Aracel, you want to share? With what no, you I know? just, I think she's a very bright, um, very um, student-oriented, and yeah, she's courageous, and I think she'd be a great representative. Okay. Great. Any other discussion? All right, it's been moved and seconded, so we will ask for a vote to approve. Was it our vote for? Yeah, Jenny? you're you're okay. as a board voting for Miss Close from Santa Rosa. All right, so let's see. We would say um, an I vote would be a vote for Jenny. All right, so all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? All right, Jenny gets our vote. Is it Jenny or Jenna? <laughs> Jenny. 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 Yeah. Okay, go Jenny. <laughs> all right, thank you. All right, reports. We uh, is there a half report this evening? There's not. Uh, right. Dennis Agnos, the president, isn't feeling well, so he Seems to be going wasn't around, able to huh? come. Yeah, so. Nobody's feeling well. All right. Well. I had a report, Mr. Flores. <clears throat> Good evening. Hello there. How are you doing today? Good, thanks. And you? It's before 9 o'clock. I know. Look at this. <laughs> Take a picture. Right. I know. Um, well, I, I have a long list of items to go through here. So um, uh, first... Of all, I would like to invite uh, all of you to the uh, 21st, to the, to the March 1st Crab Feed. This is the uh, Sonoma County Democratic um, uh, fundraiser that the uh, Sonoma Dems have every year. And HADA, along with CTA, uh, is a major sponsor for that event. So please, if you're planning to attend, we encourage you to wear red in solidarity to other uh, uh, school districts who are having difficulties in their negotiations. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about the calendar, but it seems like um, Mr. Van Hubel already talked about that. Um, I emailed you guys a document that I, I, I hope that you guys will read. Um, I will read that document hopefully next month uh, regarding uh, the elementary intervention. And labor management meetings at this point are still going very strong on all sides. I'm looking forward to uh, working with Sue at HES. Uh, we know we all had a very tumultuous year so far, and I commend the district's willingness to work in tandem with the association to make sure we find the right fit for next year. Um, now, I have a question for um, Chris. I think in your presentation regarding um, graduation requirements, was the MBA Spanish for phased in for next year? I didn't see 2021, that. it was on the slide. Got it, I missed it, thank you. Um, well, in terms, I mean, some of you asked what the uh, faculty wants regarding the uh, graduation requirements, and I think I want, I'm going to reiterate what I've mentioned before. Uh, the faculty wants a robust support, a robust support system network to make sure that we catch all students who struggle uh, and we are thankful that the district is willing to work with us to make sure that we create a comprehensive program to make sure that students are caught early 
and, uh, and, and if, there, if not, we intervene. So we have planned some meetings in the future for that. Um, so in terms of um, observations, I've been uh, privy to quite a few observations this last year here. And I think I mentioned in the last couple of board meetings that the evaluation is a, you know, it's a tool to, to make sure that there's communication between the evaluator and the teacher. Um, we, we believe that principals are mentors and master teachers, and we want them to um, start to make sure that our teachers feel supported in the areas of improvements that are identified by principals. Um, and, and I think we need to work with the district to make sure that is happening. Uh, instead of using the evaluation tool as a punitive tool. Um, lastly, I'd like to let you all know that um, on, I believe that is on March 7th, the area, the uh, Hillsborough Area Teach Association will be welcoming Eric Hines, our CTA president, here to. Uh, Hillsburg will be walking around all, uh, all the different campuses. You're more than welcome to, to walk with us. Uh, he's a very knowledgeable uh, teacher from Backerville, I, I, I want to say, uh, and he is stepping down. Um, his term limited is up, and he has chosen Hillsburg as a place to come and, and, and see what we're doing here. So I welcome you guys to be part of that tour that day. OK, any questions? No. Great. Okay, Thank great. you. Thank you, Ever. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, our student trustee report. Mr. Click. How was your golf match? Uh, it was pretty good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I had to uh, uh, speed through the ninth hole. <laughs> speed golf? <laughs> That's a real thing. All right. Thanks, Aiden. All right. Good evening, fellow trustees and board members. My name is Aiden Click, and I'm here to deliver everyone a monthly student report. We are transi transitioning from our winter uh, sports to our spring sports now at the high school, and I have some exciting things to report. First off, a uh, wrestling place second at NCS uh, team duels at Eureka, and then we went off to place uh, fourth in league finals, uh, just a few points behind Mario Carrillo. Uh, we, uh, oh, we had to forfeit five weight classes. That's why we were a few... Um, few points behind and uh seven of us varsity players placed and uh for first uh ethan williams and logan valerie both placed first at league uh second place marco montanez and sebastian novella and in third place uh myself and dalton ortiz and fifth place uh aiden bernard and those uh seven varsity um players went off to ncs that happened this last weekend um, out of all of us who went to North Coast, um, which include 95 schools, out of our out of our hounds, Marco and Mon Marco Montanez and Ethan Williams uh, placed. Uh, Marco took sixth, and Ethan took seventh. Uh, our basketball team uh, were league champions again, with an overall score of 21 and seven, but unfortunately lost in their quarterfinals at the NCS championships to Piedmont. Uh, our girls' basketball team took fourth place in league and lost in their first round of NBL playoffs. Uh, boys' soccer took second in league but lost their first round of NCS championships. Uh, spring sports started on January 28th, and we have some new coaches in the Hound family. New assistant swim coach, Lorna, uh, yeah, Lorna Heyman. Uh, our new boys' golf coach, Martin Kiff, which we're really excited about. Um, our new badminton coach, Stan Bishop. And yeah, so our leadership class is keeping up with the holidays and for Valentine's Day brought back flower grams. They've been busy cleaning up the appearance of our schools and our hallways by updating and cleaning up the bulletin boards and are also currently in the process of starting a school-wide athlete and, and scholar of the week. In other school events, this week is FFA week at the junior high or at the high school, sorry. So each uh, <laughs> each day uh, there has been a fun FFA events and dressed up uh, themes. They created uh, student surveys and are recognizing a supportive staff staff, staff member each day as well. 
Uh, day one was Miss Mora, and day two was Mr. Domenichelli. At our junior high, uh, squad uh, sold goodie bags for Valentine's week, and the leadership class hosted a red and pink out spirit day on Valentine's Day, as well as sold Polaroid photos at lunch. The leadership class is also planning their first spirit week and rally coming up the first week of March, uh, where they will be recognizing the sports teams during the rally. Also in March, the eighth grade class will be having a movie night where they will be watching The Hate You Give um, on campus uh, after school. And finally, the seventh period classes are all competing for the most uh, positive points in their penny wars. All of the proceeds will go to the future school dances and the winners are, are rewarded with a pizza party, slushies, and a brownie. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent, Aiden. Thanks, Aiden. Thank you so much for bringing us up to speed on the happenings on our campuses. Excellent, excellent. All right, uh, Board of Trustee reports. Anyone have any comments or information to share? I have a comment. Yes, ma'am. It was, uh, made me sad that Billy Harrison, who was my daughter's fourth grade teacher, um, died last Saturday. I think it was Saturday. And um, she's a former colleague of mine as well. And was beloved by a lot of her students. Anyone else have anything they'd like to share? Just a quick comment. I, last Friday, I had the opportunity to go around uh, with Shelly Anderson to visit some of the internship programs, four of them. Um, it was fun. Um, the kids are having a good time. Uh, my hat's off to our local businesses that are giving their time and their expertise and their patience. Um, a lot of really good things happening. So I was really pleased. And a couple of students that I spoke with, are you going to continue in this vein? Some said yes. Some said, nah, maybe not. But that's good. It's good at least they know. Um, also in that vein, I just want to remind the public, if you're all watching, uh, March 13th is the internship night where we get to go and listen to their presentations. And I've been, I think, four four years in a row, or four years anyway, over the last five years, um, it is outstanding to hear these students tell you what they've done. And the way they present this um, is remarkable. I mean, these are juniors that are talking like, well, like the superintendent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Better than So anyhow, they're really good. <laughs> <laughs> and they're welcoming folks that want to sit in on the presentation panel. So you can contact Shelly Anderson at, at the high school. She'd love to have... As many people. folks who would like to come and listen to the students' hard work. So you're all welcome to come and sit on a panel. Just let Miss Anderson know in advance so she can divide you up into the different rooms. So you're all welcome. Call the high school. Yeah, absolutely. Call the high school, you bet. Anyone else? All right. I just wanted to make a couple announcements that, again, the uh, next town hall equity task force uh, listening evening will be uh, Monday the 25th, which I know Mr. Vanden Heuvel mentioned. And then we have our special um, interdistrict transfer conversation meeting uh, Tuesday, the 26th at 4.30. Do I have that right? You do. At the high school? High school library. Library. So you all are welcome to those. It's a busy week next week with HUSD activities. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. All right. Um, if there's no further business, then I will announce that the next regular board meeting will be Wednesday, March 27th uh, here at City Hall. And I think that's all I need to say. Thank you all for coming tonight and we'll close the meeting.